<laughs> oh, good evening everyone and uh, welcome along to class. Very special Walter Scott evening. Um, so I'll just uh, introduce the first dance. Okay, so, uh, so Walter Scott was born in Edinburgh in 1771 and grew up to be an incredibly popular poet and novelist, hugely outselling his contemporaries Lord Byron and Jane Austen. Today, however, his books are largely forgotten. The reason why I'm so excited to be remembering him tonight is that, as well as writing, he was one of the first people to collect and document Scottish ballads. This was because he was worried that they would disappear and he was keen to preserve them for future generations. So I felt an immediate kinship with him because I feel the same way about preserving dances from 200 years ago. So in that spirit then, let's crack on with our first dance, which is named after his 1816 novel, The Antiquary. <laughs> is called the Laird of Dumbydyke's favourite. The Laird of Dumbydyke is a character from Scott's 1818 novel The Heart of Midlothian. The beginning of the novel was inspired by the real-life Porteous riots of 1736. Now a band of smugglers had tried to escape from the old Tollbooth prison in Edinburgh but they got stuck on the way out and were caught and hanged. On the day of the hanging, there was unrest amongst the crowd, and an official called Captain John Porteous ordered his men to fire into the crowd, leading to the deaths of six people. Porteous himself was then charged with murder and later dragged from prison and executed by an angry mob. So on that cheery note, let's dance the Laird of Dumbydyke's favourite. <laughs> Walter Scott travelled to Brussels to visit the site of the Battle of Waterloo. His observations of the battleground and the battle itself culminated in a poem called The Field of Waterloo. This poem describes the battle in some detail and ends with a moral to the story, which is that going to war is not about how dedicated and disciplined your soldiers are. It's not about the glory and riches it can bring. It's about the cause. The only thing that justifies going to war, says Scott, is doing so in a good cause. Is that a lesson that we've learned over the years since? Well, that's up for debate. <laughs> but in the meantime, in honour of Scott's poem, let's dance Lord Wellington's Waltz. <laughs>
Marmion, um, or A Tale of Flodden Field, is a historical romance in verse of 16th century Scotland and England by Sir Walter Scott, published in 1808. Consisting of six cantos, each with the introductory epistle and copious antiquarian notes, it concludes with the Battle of Flodden in 1513. It cost one and a half guineas um, and 2,000 copies were printed, which sold out in under two months. And by 1808, it was on its third printing. Uh, in 1808, Scott's publisher, Archibald Constable, delighted by the unprecedented success of this narrative poem, commissioned a portrait of Walter Scott from Sir Henley Rayburn. Scott makes extensive use of supernatural motifs, imagery and subject matter throughout the text. And this is linked to its thematic concern with war. Marmion was composed against the backdrop of the Napoleonic Wars from 1803 to 15 and gives tributes to eminent fallen heroes such as Nelson. The poem is also the source for the infamous quote, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive, which is often thought it comes from Shakespeare, but it's actually from Walter Scott. So there we go, Marmion. <laughs> Okay, this is Rob Roy, um, name of an, a Scott novel which portrayed a man called Rob Roy as a dashing and chivalrous outlaw. Of course, the truth was a little less glamorous. For centuries, the wild MacGregors, cattle rustlers and brigands, were the plague of the Trossacks in Scotland. The most famous or infamous member of the clan was Robert MacGregor, who was nicknamed Roy because of his curly red hair. He became a cattle rustler and stole all the cattle from his earlier benefactor, the Duke of Montrose. Although he was about to be transported to Barbados, he received a pardon from George I and reformed. The Scott novel was written in 1817 as part of the Waverley series of novels. Most of the content is fictitious and based on stories Scott had heard handed down through the generations. Although the novel is a brutally realistic depiction of the social conditions in Highland and Lowland Scotland in the early 18th century, Robert Louis Stevenson regarded it as Scott's best novel. There we go, Rob Roy. <laughs>
this is a poem which was pub published in 1810 and has six verses, each one detailing what happens in a single day. There are three main plot lines, the contest between three men to win the heart of Ellen Douglas, the feud between King James V of Scotland and James Douglas, and the war between the Lowland Scots and the Highland clans. Set in the time of James V, who was the father of Mary Queen of Scots, if I remember rightly, the Lady of the Lake is a young lady called Ellen Douglas who lives on an island on Loch Katrine. And there's a picture of the island on Loch Katrine. Uh, King James goes about in disguise and meets with Ellen and her family. Um, and it's a lot more complicated, but that's the basics. The work was very popular. 2,000 copies were initially published and it was commonly studied in schools up until the early 20th century. It generated several country dances of the same name and an opera by Rossini called La Donna del Lago, some of whose tunes were also used in quadrilles later in the 19th century. So in 1815, uh, Walter Scott published a novel called Guy Mannering, which was so popular that the first edition sold out on the first day. One of the characters in the novel was a gypsy woman called Meg Merrilies. She appears at the beginning of the novel to tell the fortune of a newborn baby called Harry Bertram. He is the heir to an estate, but is kidnapped at the age of five and taken to Holland. Many years later, he returns to Scotland with a new identity. Meg Merrilies is instrumental in helping Harry regain his fortune and marry his sweetheart. And although she dies, he at least lives happily ever after. <laughs> a dance called The Pirate, um, which was a novel published by Scott in 1822. Um, it was inspired by the real-life notorious Orkney pirate John Gow. Uh, in 1724, uh, Gow instigated a mutiny on the ship the Caroline, took over as captain, and he and his crew set about committing acts of piracy in the seas around Spain, France and Portugal. Eventually they were caught and John Gow was hanged. He wanted a quick death, so the executioner pulled him by the legs, but so hard that the rope broke. So Gao, still alive and sensible enough to climb the ladder a second time, returned to the gallows to be hanged again. <laughs> and this time it was successful. So on that grim note, let's dance the pirate. of the evening. Um, it's called The Talisman. Um, this was a novel published by Scott in 1825 and it's set in the Middle Ages during the Crusades. So in 1187 Saladin conquers much of Palestine. Whilst in the Holy Land Richard the Lionheart falls gravely ill. He asks one of his knights, Sir Kenneth, to look after his standard, or in other words flag, until he recovers. 
but Sir Kenneth is lured away by a message about his sweetheart, Edith. There's not too many sweethearts called Edith, I like that. He leaves the flag unattended and it's torn down. Meanwhile, Saladin, disguised as a physician, dips a talisman into medicine and gives it to King Richard, who immediately recovers. Sir Kenneth is banished for leaving his post, but returns in disguise and saves King Richard from assassination. He is thus forgiven, marries Edith, and Saladin presents him with a talisman that saved King Richard's life. Pretty intense stuff. <laughs> um, so let's get on and dance the talisman. Thank you. 